Our guest today is a repeat guest. Uh, he's now senior staff engineer at IonQ, Aaron Brodich. Welcome back to the show. Yeah, it's great to be back. Yeah, uh, when you were last on, you were with Entangled Networks, uh, but in January, your company was acquired by IonQ. So congratulations are in order, I believe. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, the news coverage made the deal sound like a continuation of your work. So I don't know if you wanted to talk about that a little bit at a high level. Yeah, yeah. So um, you know, mo most definitely this is uh, us continuing to do uh, the same stuff we're doing before, except uh, we're, we're uh, more focused now. Um, you know, when, when, we, when we talked last, I said, uh, you know, our, our mission statement when, when Ilya and I started Entangle Networks was to help build larger quantum computers, help scale up. Um, and, and, and so, you know, that's, you know, definitely what every quantum computer company is, is trying to do. Um, our way to do this was to go modular, to build uh, quantum interconnects. And we, we didn't invent this idea. Um, and in fact, the pioneers um, were uh, IonQ's founders, uh, Chris and Jung Sang. And so, you know, the, this continuing uh, with, with IonQ was very natural. IonQ was also our, you know, the top of our ideal customer list when, whenever we were pitching. And, and also when we started talking to IonQ, uh, the conversation was, uh, you know, you guys very clearly want to go to a modular solution. Um, we're offering uh, this stuff that, and, and that, that was for us extremely scary at first because we're, we're going to sell technology to the people who basically invented this technology <laughs> and, <laughs> and and so um you know we we were we were anxious but we we built we we waited until we we sort of built enough technology to to impress um and and we started um you know we started the journey with with iron as potential customers and um, I guess we, we must have done a very good job because <laughs> at some point they, instead of wa wanting to buy the product, they, they wanted to buy the entire operation. Um, and, and that was, you know, that was incredible for us, not only in terms of us continuing to do, you know, what we want with more resources, but also in terms of like doing it in a culture that we, we absolutely love. Um, and you know, what, what was kind of interesting about the conversations with IonQ uh, was that you know, IonQ is very customer focused. Uh, the, the idea is really to deliver um, products that will help the customers, uh, you know, get computational advantage. And the question about interconnects had always been not if we need interconnects, that's kind of obvious, but when, you know, what what is the right timing? And what we had done uh, for in particular the last year at Intangle Networks, but even even to some extent right from the beginning, was build uh, this entire stack of software that try to answer this question. Because when you're trying to sell an interconnect, the first thing you want to tell a customer is this is when you're going to need these interconnects. And so now you've got to start planning this much time ahead in order to have this, mm -hmm. uh, this in your device. And this is the advantage you're going to get if you start today. Um, and, and this, this really struck a chord with, with Iron Q. And, and so we, we just sort of merged into this, this culture of, of, you know, very engineering based decision-making, um, and, and trying to scale, you know, it's uh, fantastic. Yeah. I mean, it's clear that Iron Q is a company that gets the whole stack, you know, <laughs> from, from the software to the hardware and the idea of bringing these machines together to make a bigger, more powerful one. Um, so yeah, it does seem like a very natural fit. So that's pretty exciting news. Um, and it looks like this acquisition is, is sort of like helping launch IonQ Canada in Toronto, right? Um, so what does that look like on the ground? Uh, are there new team members? Um, maybe you have access to machines now, uh, in the area. Yeah. So, um, you know, this, this is a, it's a big thing having, having an office, a big thing for IQ, having an office in Canada, it's definitely a big thing for us, uh, you know, having access to, to talent, uh, across the border. Um, there's a ton of talent at IQ, uh, but Canada is, is a, is a, an incredible, uh, you know, quantum ecosystem. I, I arrived in Canada because I wanted to do a postdoc at the 
you know, biggest quantum computing institute in the world. Um, and, and so, uh, a lot of stuff happening in, in Canada in general and in sort of Southern Ontario and, and Toronto specifically, um, and, and also, you know, further, further field in Quebec, in Alberta, in, in BC. Um, and so, you know, this is really an opportunity, uh, for INQ to tap into a lot of talent and a lot of knowledge, uh, that, that exists in, in Canada and this, this really fantastic ecosystem. Yeah, that's great. And are you going to be able to, um, be experimenting with the machine more directly now, uh, Will there be one like physically located in Canada? Uh, so at, at the moment, uh, there, there are no plans, uh, to have any hardware in Canada. Uh, INQ has, uh, you know, okay. just come up with a, um, big, uh, big announcement of having, uh, a new, um, facility in Seattle. And so for the focus mm -hmm. on, on where we're going to build more hardware is, is in Seattle. Um, but you know, who, who knows, right. Um, you know, things, things can change. <laughs> um, yeah. Ah, it's close enough. It's just over the border practically. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, how has this, um, how has this affected your research? Uh, were there any roadblocks, uh, lifted by being part of such a big, uh, manufacturer of hardware that, that yeah. This so easier? the, you know, it's definitely removed uh, a lot of the uncertainty around, uh, what we were doing. Um, we, we were building a, a device that connects into a quantum computer. Now, you know, if you think about the usual uncertainty that startups have, we had the added bonus of needing to connect to a machine where there is no standard, there's no USB cable where you can connect. To. There's no like established software stack. Everything is, is very, very specific. This is, you know, like the early days of computers, um, you know, you have to build everything very, very specific to the machine. And at Integral Networks, as a business, we, we could not afford to focus on one customer um, because, you know, it's it's too dangerous. And so we had to be fairly broad. We, we designed things that, um, you know, had broad applicability, but we were sort of reaching the end of our ability to do that uh, especially with, with the optimization, uh, tools we were building at some point, you have to optimize for one specific machine and, and the uncertainty, not only about, you know, what the machine does now, but also what's going to happen a year from now, what's going to happen three years from now, what's going to happen five years from now. Um, and having access to a lot of very, very specific details. Um, you know, we were struggling to, to figure those things out and kind of find ways to work around uh, those, those issues. Um, and, um, you know, we, we also now have, have a lot of access to, to experts, you know, the, the best people in iron traps <laughs> and, and, you know, the people who built the first experiments on, you know, interconnect for iron traps, they're, they're, you know, they're, mm -hmm. you know, phone call away, uh, or a zoom call away. And so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely incredible. We've we've really been able to accelerate, uh, development. Um, yeah. Yeah. When we talked last time, uh, it was, the idea was that, uh, you pick one technology and, and connect that, right? So it would be transmon to transmon, trapped ion to trapped ion, et cetera. So now you're able to focus, I'm assuming on trapped ion, uh, specifically because, because of this approach. Um, yeah. Yeah. So that, that was, you know, what, what happened in terms of entangled networks was uh, when we started, we said, we'll, we'll try to be pretty broad. And then our, um, you know, we had a lot of advice from very, very smart business people who said, you should focus on one thing, try to solve one problem. And so we, mm -hmm. we zoomed in on ions, uh, because that was, you know, the, the most realistic technology for interconnects. And then we felt, oh, we're too constrained because there is like, you know, three companies that we can talk to. <laughs> <laughs> and so we started broadening out and, and thinking about neutral atoms and maybe trans ones and, and other things. Um, it's, it's nice to have that focus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, so right now is, is the approach to a perfect interconnect, um, is, is it to get that in the same room first? 
uh, and then maybe branch out. So when you're talking about connecting these machines, ideally you want them there, right? Not over some kind of like extra layer of network. Yeah, hundred percent. So uh, what what we want to do initially is to build a, a network of of quantum computers that are you know, incredibly close by. We really don't want to start worrying about photon loss in fiber. And so you know maybe it's it's good to to like just say say a couple of words about how interconnects work, uh, mm -hmm. specifically with iron traps. But this is you know, generally true. So with ion traps, what, what you want to do is you want to create entanglement between two ions, different machines. And the way that's done is uh, by having uh, each one of these ions emit a single photon and then uh, do some fancy measurement on, on those photons. Now, those photons, in order to get to the measurement device, they have to go through a fiber. And so the hardest thing, specifically with ions, is getting that photon that was emitted by the ion into a fiber. Um, because it's it's going in all different directions, and you have a lens in, in one specific point, um, and and uh, and so you know you want that to be your only worry. Like, how do I get that into fiber? If we start going long distance, now the photon can also get lost in the fiber. <laughs> That's you know we, we we need to do that one at a time. Also, generally for computation, you want things to be as fast as possible, right? Even mm -hmm. when you build a supercomputer, you don't want to put half of it in. You know, in Tennessee, and half of it in some some other some other place. Uh, but... Yeah, I was going to ask if there were um, th about the additional concerns with hardware and software for long distance. It, it becomes about those physical um, blocks. It also becomes about there, there has to be a whole other software layer and protocol, right? If you're dealing with like any kind of appreciable distance, you would need yeah, repeaters so and things like that. It's it's a it's a different it's a completely different story when when you're going uh when you're going long distance it's also different use cases um but let, let's you know start with with the hardware constraints um so you you have uh you have to go long distance you have to start worrying about loss of photons through fiber if you're going through fiber if you're going in free space apart from losing photons um you also have to worry about that a uh, giant yellow ball that's emitting a ton of photons that are just going to kill you in terms of noise. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you focus on on loss, you, you just have to get the photons. You know, the photons are carrying entanglement from one point to the other, and mm -hmm. and you want them to, to arrive safely at their destination. Um, and, and you can't copy the information, right? So what you do with, with standard photons, you know, just use... You don't call it photons; you call it light because there's, <laughs> you know, billions of them, um, and and you shoot it through a fiber, and then you put an amplifier every every few kilometers or every few hundred kilometers, and and you amplify uh, the signal, and that works great. Classically, in quantum, you can't do that; you cannot amplify the signal, um, and so you have to to use other tricks, which are quantum repeaters, and and what the what 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 that creates is, is another sort of technological barrier. Um, you know, quantum computers are actually, in fact, ion trap quantum computers um, make great quantum repeaters. Um, but but now you have to you have to deal with with you know putting a quantum computer at each node. The, the other big problem is converting uh, between frequencies. Um, if if you want to if you want to go long distance, there, there are two sort of best ways to, to go around it. One is to work uh, in fiber, and then you have to use telecom frequencies. Um, and ions don't work in telecom frequencies. We're, we're in sort of visible. Um, and uh, and the, the other way is to, to work in, in atmospheric windows if you're going free space. But again, with free space, there's a whole bunch of, of other problems. Um, and so, you know, generally you're dealing with like two other problems converting the light and then uh and then having uh um the repeaters so so by having this new um only local networking to make these machines work as one close by uh, have you already seen some kind of improvement because you're focusing on one technology has, has that that liberation process 
of, of only focusing on ion Q on, on trapped ion made it um, more effective quicker? Yeah, it's it's you know it's it's not just about looking at trapped ion. It's about looking at what specific type of ion. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's about looking you know knowing what the trap looks like, knowing what the size of of the window is on that trap, so we know what kind of lens goes in there, and we can start you know having much much better estimates of of how many photons we're going to get. It's you know but understanding all all the different technologies that we can now sort of come up with, um, can we move ions around? You know, are, is, that, is that sort of a legal operation? Is that within the roadmap? Um, you know, what, how far the ions are spaced from, from each other because of, of trap design constraints? Um, you, you, you just, you know, you, you can suddenly, like I said, there's no USB, right? And so you, you're n- now it's, it's not only that we, we can, um, you know, mold ourselves to the parameters we can also change the parameters to fit us and so that's you know that just changes changes everything it's funny how sometimes constraints can be liberating (laughs) in a way right if you have to narrow the focus you you get things done better you know it it applies here i suspect that something like that might happen yeah that's pretty exciting um yeah so obviously the goal here is to one day have an even bigger uh, I guess ion Q machine because they're all they're all going to work together in a sense. So that's really exciting stuff. Um, so how does being part of ion Q affect plans for? Um, I, I, you remember you called it Q Link. Um, th- so that was going to be in general used to one day connect different types of systems to or or over distance, right? If I'm correct. So uh, is that affecting any plans for that? Does ion Q um, envision experimenting with other types of quantum computers too? Uh, in the future, so, so right, right now, um, you know, future is very focused on doing ion traps and sort of expanding mm-hmm. to a certain size. Um, but if if we think again, you know, what what does Q Link uh, our our inter the interconnect we design do? It collects uh, the photons into fiber and then it, it fuses them together in order to to swap the entanglement from the photons into uh, into the qubits in this case ions um, and. And Q-Link had always been designed to work at optical frequencies, um, mm-hmm. and and so it would it it would never have worked, you know, off the shelf for things like uh, transmode qubits, which work at uh, microwave frequencies. Um, and so our dream, you know, even at Entangled Networks, had always been that someone will come up uh, with something that can convert from microwave to, to optical, and that that's an insanely hard challenge. Like. We, we were asked repeatedly, you know, will you guys be doing that? We, we didn't think that, you know, we, we didn't have the skill set to do that conversion. It's, it's, it's very difficult. But once that happens, it will unlock, I think, a lot of things for industry. I, a, a lot of, you know, companies will, will be rethinking the next generations of quantum computers because suddenly you can use the advantages of, of different technologies uh, to go from one, one place to the other. I suspect that the first step in seeing conversion between different technologies is going to be um, between ions and uh, and photonic uh, quantum computers, um, because uh, the the relative shift in frequencies is is much easier. You don't have to go all the way to microwave, um, and there is there is a ton that can can be done, you know, in, in that direction. Already now, we we kind of know of of use cases where where that could be uh, you know very interesting, um, and so you know I, I certainly think that if if, you know, if if there's one piece that's missing right now in in industry, and it would be fantastic if, if someone could uh, could build it, and there, there are a few companies doing that, is is converting uh, between frequencies and sim photons, so taking an, an optical photon and, and converting it say from uh you know from blue to to infrared yeah i'm, I'm sure one of those things um is perfected i'm going to have them on this show too so we'll, <laughs> we'll hear from that um so let's dig a little into the technical specifics here uh how has performance evolved since we spoke uh i remember you um you felt that one kilohertz speeds of interconnect would be possible with trapped ions last time uh, are you still seeing um, an order of magnitude performance hit for like a two qubit gate if it's done over an interconnect. 
Yeah, yeah. So um, that, that's that's a that's a fantastic question. Um, so what what we we kind of uh, saw when we were um, you know doing our our initial analysis at Entangle Networks was that um, we we can we can live with about uh, one over one thousand uh, ratios between uh, entanglement generation rates and T two. Um, and so that, that allows us to, to, you know, very, very fundamentally run some circuits. Um, and, uh, we, we, we also kind of looked at what happens at the ratios between, uh, you know, how fast a two qubit gate is and how fast it takes, uh, to, to build up entanglement and, and use that. What we've done, uh, on top of that in, in sort of the next phase is try to understand uh, how everything works together when you start accounting for noise, um, and and in in the first analysis, the only noise we accounted for was T two, so just natural decoherence. Uh, but once you you try to to uh, go a bit deeper, you need to think about gate noise, and and we discovered something, which is not surprising, um, but it's it's nice to see it in in actual simulation, and that is that the thing that you know, hurts you the most is actually the fidelity of the two qubit gates. And so what you, what, what you're doing when you use an interconnect is you have the entanglement that you created, but now you need to somehow use that to do things like teleportation and that costs a number of gates. So you need to add a few more gates uh, to your system. And it turns out that those additional gates, you know, with, with sort of today's performance, they're, they're, they're a big hit. You don't, you don't want to add more gates to your system. And so now there is um, this multifaceted challenge. Um, again, this is not unexpected, but it is you want to improve interconnect rates. Uh, you want to improve to qubit gates. You want to know which one is going to be most in your favor in terms of getting overall performance. Um, and that's a lot of the analysis we're, we're doing. We're really trying to figure out you know, wh which one is going to, to pay off more you know, where should should the focus be in terms of of development? Um, in terms of the one one kilohertz, so between five hundred hertz and two kilohertz, those are kind of the boundaries for getting a single ion uh, to or two single ions to get entangled uh, using, let's say, fairly standard technology that has been demonstrated, um, but pushing it really to the edge of of engineering. Um, beyond that, you need to start either multiplexing, uh, that's the easiest thing or going into, uh, you know, very, very different types of, of technology, but we're really seeing, uh, you know, when you think about rates, you really need to think about the system as a whole. It's not just about how fast you're, you're, you're going to go. It's about how fast should you go in order to maximize performance. Um, and, and what are the trade-offs, how many ions you're going to use, how many, you know, how big is the chain, like every single piece comes into play here. Um, and, and, you know, again, this is, uh, a lot of clarity now that we're sort of in the system and, and can kind of understand what's going on there. Yeah. I, I'm assuming the general plan is to get an optimal number of qubits on a trapped ion system one day. We'll figure out what that is. I don't think everyone, anyone knows yet what that is, right? But to figure out what that is and then connect these machines together. Do you, is there going to be a technical limitation to how many machines we can connect together? You think there, there comes a point, there might come a point where there's like an overhead or something that's introduced. I'm just curious. I'm not sure if it's possible to know this yet. Yeah. So, so that's, that's a good, it's a, it's a good question. It's, it's an interesting one. Um, and you know when when, when you physicists and, and I'm a physicist by training, we we always uh, you know make make very ideal assumptions about the world, um, and then you try to build a system and you you realize that okay, there's all these you know small engineering constraints that that are going mm -hmm. to uh, to mess with you. Uh, you know at at small numbers, at the kind of numbers we're seeing for you know at least uh, the next few years. It's, it, we're not expecting uh, you know, any like major blocks in terms of like how many uh, how many devices we can connect together. 
apart from needing a switch that will allow us to route uh, route the, the photons where we want them to to go. Uh, but once once we get to larger sizes, we're going to have to start worrying about bandwidth and um, mm -hmm. delays and how how close together we can pack those computers because as soon as they start getting further apart, it's, it's going to be a problem. And how many switches do we need? And you know, when when they build, you know, this is kind of amazing. But when they build um, supercomputers, right? When they build Frontier, you know, the number one constraint is power. So, so with quantum computers, we know power requirements are not going to be as high as as classical computers. But you know, we, we are going to see these new requirements pop up. Um, that that I, I think there's there's going to be surprises when when we get to a lot of qubits. I don't think yeah, I'm sure. it'll be something to monitor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, it seems like something that uh, that's going to have to just come up one day. It's hard to figure from now. Uh, what, what kinds of software? Um, advances did your team bring to IonQ? Uh, it, it sounded like from the announcement, if I remember, it sounded like they were talking about some kind of boost to the stack as well that Entangle Networks yeah. bring. Yeah. So a lot of what uh, what we did at Entangle Networks was software work. Um, mm -hmm. Again, we were trying to really answer the question, when are interconnects needed? How fast do they need to be? You know, Because you're trying to build an interconnect. <laughs> First thing you need to know is, where are you aiming? What is you know the minimal viable product, um, and and what's sort of the next steps? Um, and and the first thing we built was a compiler, which which works incredibly well for taking a program and distributing it into multiple uh, systems. That compiler um, was was meant to to work on a multi-core quantum machine. Um, it also has some capabilities that are applicable uh, on single-core machines, so that. You know that adds value uh, very quickly, um, but then we we also built a ton of other tools that haven't been uh, made uh, public, and those are uh, analysis tools that kind of let you figure out uh, how how well your system is going to perform under different constraints. You know, and and again, the question is, how many qubits do you need per module? You know, how many modules is optimal? How do you get more performance out of your machine in the best way? Get you know these architectural considerations. They're they're huge. There's there's so many questions that you know we 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 didn't see anyone answering, um, and and so uh, you know we just had to build the software to ensure them. Oh, that makes sense. Um, so. Your, your training then, uh, obviously, physicist, and, and you go into engineering and software. So we talk a lot on this show about like paths people can take to becoming a quantum coder. It seems like making use cases work is, is the easiest path to entry for quantum. Uh, but what about networking? Like, uh, What kind of development path would you recommend someone who's interested in this field follow if they want to work in it? Yeah, so I, I think you know the bar for networking is is definitely high, higher than coding. Um, mm -hmm. You know you need you need some some kind of experience working in in something that that is really related. Um, but what, one thing that I, I I feel is is always very strange. Somehow, you know, going into sort of the software and the applications uh, side of quantum has become you know incredibly popular. In some cases, at the expense of of other areas, and you know, I talk to a lot of people who ask me for for advice about what they should do, and I see someone who has this incredible CV and has expertise in a certain subfield of quantum, and I I'm thinking this person would be perfect, you know, to to fix this problem that I have because you know there's like five experts in the world and he's one of them, um, and then. Uh, you know, and then they say, we want to go into coding. Why? Well, it seems like this is where all the jobs are. And it's like, no, you're an expert in, in this field. And so I think people should, you know, sit and, and think what they can offer, what's new that they can offer in quantum, in, in quantum communication. Uh, you know, anyone with, with experience in classical communication, I think is, is, is interesting. Anyone in experience in fundamental quantum computing, if you've built a piece of a quantum computer, whether it's ions, uh, you know, you've you've fabricated 
uh, you know, devices. You've you've built, um, you know, you've you've done uh, you've created pulses for, for quantum computers. You know, there's so many different small things that you've done, and uh, you know, and you're an expert on. It. And and I think mm-hmm. you know these these experts don't don't realize how much value they can add if if they just find sort of the right niche. Um, and you know, one thing that kind of happens to to a lot of uh, people um, who are doing their PhDs is you look around you and you're the stupidest person in the room because everyone else is you know has ten years of experience and you only have five years of experience. But you know you have five years of experience more than ninety nine point nine 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 percent of the population. <laughs> and, and <laughs> yeah, so that's true. I, I I think people should really assess their their own skills and, and figure out you know what do I know that someone else doesn't, and what do I love that someone else uh, you know, might not be an expert on, and try to you know try to find yourself in that niche rather than kind of the look of uh, you know, how can I modify my own skills in order to fit something that is maybe not so interesting or maybe um, you know not not really something that I want to work on yeah that's great I, I really appreciate the insights in that answer because um, a lot of people are just thinking about coding as the only way in but uh, this is a full stack from hardware up to many layers of software and uh, yeah I, I agree there's a lot of unique skills that can help it all along and and what, um, one thing we we need is we need engineers <laughs> you know quantum mm-hmm. is just full of physicists and theoretical computer scientists and you know we're we're good at what we do but you know, to build a machine, you need engineers. You need people who have had that that insight, people who've had experience. You know, people who've done project management. There's there's just so many so many ways to go beyond just writing code, <laughs> where you can you can. Yeah, out. I agree. What's the number one thing you hear right after someone comes up with a scientific idea? They then say, "Okay, now it's an engineering problem." You know, <laughs> like that's almost always said uh, when they're getting ready to roll something out. So I agree. Yeah. Um, It it does take all types to get this industry to move forward. Uh, Yeah. So with that, I'll thank you again for coming back to to share some updates with us. And uh, good luck in in connecting these already amazing machines to make even more amazing ones in the future. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much for hosting me.